those who've had an ischemic stroke will, will know that they're given a drug called TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. So this is a drug which is a clot buster. So it's the one treatment we've got for stroke, which is given to people with ischemic stroke, not hemorrhagic, and it breaks down blood clots. And it's very good. It can work very well, but it doesn't always work in all people. It's one reason we think it doesn't always work is because of the, obviously blood clots are made up of different things, different uh, proteins and different cells come together to form a clot. So therefore, the, the composition of the clot, what it's made up of, will determine how it breaks up mm -hmm. in reaction to a drug. So it's believed that TPA doesn't break up some types of clot. For example, platelets are blood-borne cells that, that are particularly present in clots. So we've developed a drug, a new drug here in Manchester, which is just as early stages, which will basically break up clots that TPA doesn't. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to episode 230 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. If you'd like to support the show, the best way to do it is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, please comment below the video like this episode and to get notifications of future episodes subscribe to the show hit the notifications bell my guest today is professor stuart allen a professor of neuroscience in the faculty of life sciences at the university of manchester united kingdom who is working with people from around the world to find new treatments to decrease the impact of ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke and it is such an insightful episode because it provides hope for people for better outcomes after stroke all over the world. Professor Stuart Allen, welcome to the podcast. Well, uh, pleased to be here. Thank you for being here. Uh, we got in touch because on episode 187, I interviewed Fiona Moss, the sister of Natalie Kate Moss, who passed away due to uh, brain hemorrhage. And in memory of Natalie, her family set up the Natalie Kate Moss Trust. And they're doing amazing work raising money to fund some research pro programs, I believe, at the University of Manchester in the in England. And a lot of the time, Stuart, what happens is we we hear from all the people doing all the great work, raising money and funneling it down all the correct avenues to get it to people like you to do some research. But we very rarely hear from the research research about the kind of research that we're doing. And I, I feel like we're missing that opportunity to connect with the people who are at the cold face of discoveries and trying to come up with new ways to support stroke survivors and other people with neurological conditions. And that's why I'm really pleased to have you here on the podcast. Before we get into the conversation, tell me a little bit about you and your role at the uh, University of Manchester. Yeah, absolutely happy to do so. Well, so my, uh, as you as you said, I'm Professor Stuart Allen. I, I work here in the University of Manchester. I've been here for 29 years. Uh, I came to Manchester after I'd completed my PhD uh, in uh, the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Uh, and I, I moved to Manchester to to continue or to really start researching a topic which at the time in the 90s was was poorly understood, which is the contribution of inflammation in the brain to to, neuro, to brain disease, particularly stroke. So uh, that was a journey that started back in the 90s. And so over that time, I've obviously secured an academic position and a uh, now lead a group, so I lead a, a group here in Manchester that, that has a real focus on understanding inflammation, what happens in the brain in stroke, why stroke occurs, and and what the sort of consequences of that stroke are to brain, to the to the brain itself, and actually more widely. And if and actually what we are most importantly trying to do is try and find ways to reduce the impact of stroke. I'm, uh, so I'm we have a group. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to ask a question. I want to interrupt there because, yeah, no and, and, and some of my questions, they're just me thinking out loud. And these are the things I'm curious about. And maybe you can or can't answer them because your yeah. work may not have led you down that path. 
what comes first inflammation or the stroke ah very good question so uh we think another evidence suggests that actually inflammation probably is a potential contributor to stroke happening so if you look at the reasons there are different reasons people have a stroke of course and there's different mm -hmm. subtypes of stroke some are some are genetic so there's some rare causes that are genetic uh, and in the case of uh, Natalie uh, Kate Moss, who you mentioned, she had a, a particular feature in her blood vessels in the brain that might well have been there since birth that caused the, a rupture of the blood vessel. But many types of stroke are caused by risk factors. So, for example, if somebody has a, a, a high tension, so high blood pressure, if somebody has a atherosclerosis where they've got buildups of fat in the in, in the vessels in the body, and these are all inflammatory. So these are inflammatory conditions. And actually, probably the best evidence that inflammation might cause stroke is, is infection. So if somebody has an infection, you're about three times more likely to have a stroke. Uh, and, and actually, COVID has, has confirmed that data. So if you look in COVID, there's an there's a increased risk of basically clotting and, and clots forming in COVID. So, so we think inflammation may be partly contributing towards stroke it's not the total cause mm -hmm. but what's what's not in question i think is that once you once you have a stroke so once there's a bleed or a, a clot forms in the brain then there's processes that take place in the in the brain and around the body that are that you would call inflammatory I, and some I, of these are some of these are good to be honest inflammation is a good thing you know we, we use it and some of these are probably good responses but some are bad responses inflammation which is good for example is when you cut your hand it gets inflamed and then it, it heals and it hurts and yeah. it's hot and yeah. it's all weird but then it gets better right so that's good inflammation yeah. absolutely so inflammation that happens in the brain um so inflammation before stroke might be happening in a different location and then the brain gets impacted and then you have inflammation in a, another location where the infarct is or where yeah, uh, the hemorrhage was. Yeah, no, absolutely right. But spot on, Bill. Yeah, the inflammation pre-stroke is probably peripheral, you know, in the body, and you know, it could be in a blood vessel, or it could be, and then the, the stroke happens in the brain, and then there's local, there, there's local inflammation. You call it local, so around about where the brain damage is, you get inflammation, but also more widely again, you know, the body, which sort of makes sense. If something happens in the brain, the body responds to that. So the so the immune immune cells are produced in the bone marrow. And they will then travel to the brain because they obviously think something's going wrong, and they'll they'll move to the brain to to uh, to do something in the same way they would move to a, to to uh, kill a bug to kill a uh, you know an infection that you had. And, and we then, still don't really know fully what that in you know how that inflammation what it what the different I suppose we could talk about benefits and downfalls of inflammation. Yeah, yeah, so I feel I feel like inflammation at the acute phase in the brain is really good. It's kind of trying to support healing and recovery similar to what's happening in the finger. But then it seems to be that inflammation with regards to stroke, especially ischemic and hemorrhagic scenarios, tends to long-term ongoing inflammation seems to be then negatively impacting the brain over and above what the stroke already did what already the initial uh, yeah, that, incident absolutely. did. Yeah, that's what we think. Yeah, that if you've got this, so what happened, what happened, you know, you, you've got a great analogy. If you cut your finger, it's a bit painful, it, it's sore, it goes red, but then it's okay. You know, within a, a, a day or two, it's fine. It's all healed. What doesn't, that doesn't tend to happen in the brain. So you don't get this resolution. So that's, that's called resolution of inflammation. You don't, there doesn't seem to be that same resolution. A, or the response is prolonged. So it's prolonged and it causes a continued problems, basically. A, and I think most importantly, it doesn't, it doesn't allow recovery. A, and, you know, why the brain tissue doesn't recover in the way that peripheral tissue does is obviously some mm -hmm. evolutionary reason. I don't, you know, the brain is sort of protected from the rest of the body. Uh, so it might just be there's fundamental differences. Yeah. When I was experiencing the first, when I experienced the first uh, hemorrhage as a result of a faulty 
blood vessel, an arteriovenous malformation that burst in 2012. One of the first things they did is they they prescribed me with dexamethasone, a seriously serious uh, steroid medication that uh, has t- 60 side effects and I experienced probably 20 of them. Um, however, what it was designed to do was decrease the inflammation in the brain that was occurring as a result of the blood that had leaked from the blood vessel into the brain. Uh, So I knew, before I knew anything else about anything, I knew that they were actually trying to decrease the inflammation in my brain. And it made complete sense to me. But that's kind of all I got from it. Like that's as much as I understood about it. And of course, I didn't know that um, other people were working in the background you know, in the universities of the of the world to find ways to support stroke survivors. So once I, I discovered the Flory Institute in, in, in Melbourne, in, in Victoria here, I got really excited that there was a whole bunch of people working to support us overcome these issues and find new ways to do that. Tell me about some of the research that you're currently involved in and what it's aiming to do and how far down the rabbit hole you guys have gone. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's different, if you, you know, what, what, what I talk about now very much so, and, and you, you'll be able to, I'm sure, relate to this as other stroke survivors will, is about that patient journey. Because people, you know, obviously stroke happens in an instant. So it's an instant event that happens to somebody, whether it be, in your case, an, an AVM that ruptured or a, or a clot. And so the journey, but the journey begins before stroke, obviously, about if you've got a risk. So if you've got an AVM that's, identified on, on a scan you know does somebody does a neurosurgeon do something to try and remove that avm to prevent the, the blood so that's prevention and of course prevention in many ways is the, is the is what we really want to achieve mm-hmm. we, do, we don't do a lot we personally our own research group don't do a lot on prevention and that's not because it's not important it's just it, it's sort of a different ballpark so where we are focused now is really when immediately after the stroke happens. So whether you get bleeding in the brain or whether you have a clot, we've spent many years trying to understand what's happening in that first few hours after after the stroke happens, because we know that, that basically brain cells die. So that, you know, the consequence of stroke, whether it be hemorrhagic or, or ischemic stroke, which is a clot, is that brain cells die. And like many people around the world, we were trying to understand why the cells die, and most importantly, can we stop the cells dying, or at least reduce reduce the number of brain cells that die? Because the problem is, if brain cells die, then you lose function of that part of the brain, uh, and that 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 work has been successful in that we you know we have identified using, and we use different approaches. You know, we use cell culture where we culture cells in a dish, and we can expose them to different things that that might be floating about in the brain after stroke to, to damage cells. We also use a uh, mouse and, and rat models where we can mimic what happens in, in a stroke. And we've identified, as I mentioned, that inflammation is important. So we, we've got two, two approaches here, actually. One is to give an anti-inflammatory drug, exactly what like you mentioned, not dexamethasone, because dexamethasone, as you rightly say, has multiple different effects and actually was not successful in trials when they looked at dexamethasone. And that's large because it's a steroid that has multiple other actions. We've identified a, an anti-inflammatory drug which which only only works much is much more focused than dexamethasone, and it it acts to block or stop the actions of a protein in the in the body that's produced after stroke. It's called interleukin one. So interleukin one is a is a cytokine. It's a protein that's produced by immune cells to fight infection. It's also a protein that's produced in the brain when you have a fever. So if, if anyone who's had a high temperature will, will be aware, they'll be experiencing the effects of this protein in the, hyper, in the brain because it causes your temperature to rise. So we've got a drug. We know that there's a drug that's uh, licensed for use in patients for some what, uh, inflammatory disease that we've tried in animals and it, we show it works in terms of it reduces brain damage. It makes animals better. And that's been tested in in patients. So it's been tested in in hemorrhage patients and patients with a clot. 
and it, it it basically worked in terms of it reduced inflammation. So that that's good because it tells you it's 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 the drug is doing what it's meant to do. Of course, the important thing that the drug that people want to know is does it improve outcome, i.e., a stroke patients better. And that's being tested now. So, so the drug is in what we call phase three trial. So it's been tested in hundreds of patients with hemorrhage, with subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is a which is a bleed around the brain. So we'll know in about two years or eighteen months' time that 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 trial will finish. And if if people are better, so at three months after the stroke, I think it's three months, uh, or six months outcome. If people are are deemed to be better who've taken the drug versus the, the placebo, then that drug will have will have proven to be beneficial. But we, of course, we don't know. Yeah. So that works, that work's been done in Manchester. The other work we're doing is, is much more focused around, so in, those who've had an ischemic stroke will, many of them will know that they're given a drug called TPA, a tissue plasminogen activator. So this is a drug which is a clot buster. So it's the one treatment we've got for stroke, which is given to people with ischemic stroke, not hemorrhagic, because, and it breaks down blood clots. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very good. It can work very well, but it doesn't always work in all people. Uh, and there's some reasons why that is. One reason we think it doesn't always work is because of the, obviously blood clots are made up of different things, different, different uh, proteins and different cells come together to form a clot. So therefore, the, the composition of the clot, what it's made up of, will, will uh, determine how it breaks up mm -hmm. in reaction to a drug. So it's believed that TPA doesn't break up some types of clot. For example, platelets uh, are, are blood-borne cells that, that are particularly present in clots. So we've developed a drug, a new drug here in Manchester, which is this is the early stages. We've developed a new drug which we which will basically break up clots that TPA doesn't. So we think it might have benefits. Improved efficacy, as we refer to it, compared to TPA. So this is the early days. This has been tested in animals. Uh, we the drug has been patented now, so we it, you know, which is important because obviously you can then try and develop it and get the funding to develop it further. So that that's one other bit of work, which is quite exciting. Uh, and then related to that is is work on hemorrhage. So hemorrhages are, you know, hemorrhages are devastating. You know, the, the statistics for hemorrhage are quite startling, actually. So the, the death, the number of people who die from hemorrhage has not really changed in about 30 years or 40 years, mm. which is really quite disturbing, actually. Wow. You what kind of the if you consider the improvements in medicine uh, across most areas, and yet in, in this particular type of stroke, there's no improvement in mortality for many decades, uh, and it's a very high mortality. About 40% of people will die within one month. Wow. And that's a, a few reasons why. You know, it's obviously you get bleeding in the brain. It causes, you know, quite a lot of damage. It causes increases in pressure. And there's no treatment. There's really no treatment. So we're we're really trying now, and, and actually the Natalie Kate Moss Trust really got us started on working on hemorrhage. We didn't do much work on hemorrhage before, but they, they really opened their eyes to this the fact that hemorrhage was under-researched and there was a real desperate need for treatment. So we're we're doing a lot of work now uh, in the group trying to you know find ways to help uh, the outcome in hemorrhage. And that can be given, you know, what's definitely known now is that obviously when you have a hemorrhage, the big difference between hemorrhage and ischemic stroke is you get bleeding in the brain. And you talk, you know, the, so the blood leaks into the brain Blood is not a good thing to have in your brain, okay? The brain, it doesn't, it breaks down. So the blood cells break down and release iron, for example. That's toxic. That kills neurons and it causes uh, damage. So one of the strategies that people think may be important to do is to, is to basically remove that blood as quickly as possible. And that's been done in surgery. So surgeons can go in and take the blood out. It's not, that's not it, as yet been shown to be successful. Uh, but there might be other ways to do that. And we think, you know, some of my colleagues are working on research where they think they can, for example, uh, change or, or, or make the immune cells in the body or the brain uh, eat up the blood, basically swallow up the blood and remove it. And that happens already. That happens anyway. 
But if we can speed that process up, then it might remove the blood quicker and make the, the outcome better. It, it happened. So these are what we call to me. That happened to me. So I had a the first bleed was uh, quite small, uh, about the size of my th my thumbnail uh, in size, and the second bleed was about the size of a golf ball, hmm. and it took it started to decrease in size, but it took around about I want to say about 18 months before it got to a point where it was starting to get out of the way and allowing the uh, radiographers to take MRIs and actually see beyond the bleed uh, beyond, beyond the clot uh, and as it started to decrease in size more and more of my function came on and came back on and came back on I started to feel a lot better but it but for a good nine eight to nine months, I was really on another planet. My brain had completely turned off and I wasn't operating uh, the same way that I was before that before that second bleed. Um, at one point, I didn't know my wife's name. I couldn't remember who came to visit me. There was so, I couldn't drive, I couldn't work. Uh, there were so many, I had fatigue. Uh, I, I'd start a sentence and not be able to finish it. Uh, all sorts of issues along that and they kind of started to subside each one of those issues subsided as the blood clot got smaller and we're able to track the size of it by doing multiple scans once a month to see um, how much it was decreasing and whether it was still bleeding and getting bigger but mm -hmm. um, the third bleed uh, that happened which was in November uh, 2014 so almost uh, two and a half years after the original uh, bleed, that bleed ended up me requiring brain surgery. And that was when my surgeon, my neurosurgeon said, look, we've got to go in now because this thing is continuing to bleed. It's going to be risky. It may cause you more harm and it may put you in a situation where you're driving and it's dangerous and you kill yourself or somebody else and all that stuff. And I was very motivated by now, nearly three years in, to just have this resolved. And the challenge is that after the brain surgery, that's when I woke up with deficits that have not gone away. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com, and download the guide. It's free. So I had brain, brain surgery in 2014, and now I live with left side numbness constantly. Um, tightened uh, some spasticity that's not visible in in my arm function but uh, muscle tightness and all that type of thing um, temperature difference on my left side compared to my right side um, hypersensitivity on my left side compared to my right side my left side gets more tired much more quicker than my right side and when I have a drink which is very rare but if I have one drink uh, my left side pretty much is already drunk and gone my right side still wants to have a party. Um, <laughs> so what you're what you're saying about the uh, the surgery option, it seems to be a good resolution and a full stop to this faulty blood vessel that wants to continue to to bleed. Mm. Uh, but it was the thing that made me unwell, more unwell than than all the bleeds. Even though the bleed, the second bleed, was very serious. If it got out of hand, it would have been far worse. Mm. Uh, but um, I I get excited when I hear about things like um, research into hemorrhagic strokes. Now, um, again, 
prevention doesn't seem to be on the radar of too many people. I know in Australia, the National Stroke Foundation does preventative work. So as a stroke safe ambassador that I am, I'll go around and I'll talk to people about uh, how to prevent stroke, whether it's uh, usually around the talking about ischemic stroke, but there's not a lot of talk around about going and getting your, your head scanned, for example, so that you can see whether there's an AVM in there. And then even if you do find an AVM or a cavernous angioma, and then it's like, what do I do with it? You know, do I go in and take it out when it hasn't done anything to me for all these decades? Or do I go in and risk brain surgery and get and get it removed? Um, they're the challenges that that I find. You know, th that's one of the things that it'd be really difficult for me to get behind. Uh, I kind of want people to be aware as to whether or not they've got a a AVM or a cavernous angioma in their head, but uh, but then I, I don't want to be the person who says, "Yeah, go have brain surgery." Uh, because I don't know what that's going to end up doing to you. So it's a very interesting situation, but to find out that perhaps we can remove clots in the brain quicker uh, somehow, that's really exciting. And that would have been amazing for me because that would have given me back nine months of... Mm -hmm being in la la land yeah yeah no, absolutely and your you know your point about you know everyone because you could argue that everyone has a brain scan when they're you know early on and identify an avm or that but as you exactly say the problem is there's no there's no treatment uh, as such and you know the quandary then is for the neurosurgeon you know it's not uh, and the patient is do do you operate to remove but potentially cause a bleed so that's that is a quandary in terms of you know removing blood so i think the what what's exciting, I think, is that, that it's definitely been recognised that doing surgery, major surgery, so major invasive surgery, where you you might remove some of the bone, and I, don't, I, don't, I, suspect, I suspect this might have happened for you, mm. where they do quite major surgery, that definitely doesn't work, and that's probably due to the the complications and the the impact of the surgery itself, because it's not great opening up the bone in the head, and if you're going to dig in and get the blood out, it's causing damage anyway. But what the neurosurgeons are doing now is actually what they call minimally invasive surgery. So they're basically trying to be, you know, as careful as possible to disrupt, to cause as least disruption as possible to the normal tissue. So they'll drill a very small hole, a very, very small hole, and, and put a very, very fine uh, needle into the bleed and then try and remove it either by injecting TPA, which I talked about earlier on, which will uh -huh. break down the blood and, and suck it out, basically. Right. Or, and there's a trial now in Holland, just started actually, where they're, they basically, I think there's the, 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 the device they put in, the small needle has a little blade that cuts up the blood and again, sucks it out basically. So that, that definitely holds promise. I think that definitely will have, holds promise. And for me, most excitingly as a basic scientist, because one of the challenges in treating stroke is if you need to get the drug to where the damage is, i.e. the brain, uh, that's not always easy because obviously the brain is protected. So, so you know, the brain has a, what we call the, the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. the, the brain doesn't let drugs to get in very easily and other, other substances. So that's a challenge. And that's one of the reasons actually why so many brain diseases are very hard to treat because actually it's difficult to get drugs designed that will get into the brain. Nice. But actually, if a surgeon is going into the brain anyway to remove a clot, then actually you can go, you've got a route into the brain directly. So what mm -hmm. I think most excitingly for me is, is that if somebody's, if they do the minimally invasive surgery, removes the clot, which I think undoubtedly is a good thing, and at the same time, inject a drug directly into the, the tissue, mm -hmm. then that, that will promote repair, then you've got a double win, basically. And I think that, to me, is the exciting thing, which... Uh, could be the future treatment, you know, could be the, the, the way forward to try and impact hemorrhage. Of course, what we don't know is what that drug, you know, what drug we put into the brain to, to repair uh, yeah. the brain or reduce damage. But I think that definitely has opportunity to do that. If definitely. You, are you able to give some kind of a description or explanation about what the blood, 
brain barrier is. I've heard about it. I understand what it does. Basically, from my, my understanding, what it does, it, it stops um, foreign, uh, toxic foreign substances from getting through uh, the blood and yeah. into the brain. But it. is it a physical barrier? Is it inside the blood vessels? Like, where is it? Yeah, so it's so basically it's the blood vessels themselves. So, you know, blood vessels are made up of... Uh, uh, what we call endothelial cells. So the so endothelial cells are the are the cells that make up your blood vessels throughout the whole body, uh, along with other cells that that, are, that form alongside them and in, in muscle muscle cells. But basically, the endothelial cells are the main cells. And and if you can imagine these cells joining end on end, so these cells link up end on end. And the diff the big difference is, and this is the the key difference is the cells and other other organs in the body and and uh, do not. It, they join up, but not that tightly. So the the join between the two cells is actually quite loose, uh, which allows movement of substances in and out a bit easier. The brain cells have what we call tight junctions. So it's simply they're, they're, they're referred to as tight junctions. So basically, the cell, the contact between two cell adjacent cells, is very tight, and that's by special, you know. That's because it's has special proteins and special complexes that form between the two cells, mm -hmm. and that that's what makes it tight. That's what makes the blood brain barrier what it is. So it's not a special, anything special. It's just the endothelial cells are different, uh -huh. and they form this tight barrier. So that, so nothing can move between the cells. So if you imagine trying to squeeze through a gap, you know if you've got a, 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 a you've got a door that's slightly ajar, then you can get squeeze through that gap. If it gets a bit bigger, you can get more things through it. The blood brain, basically, the blood brain barrier is a door that's really tightly shut, and you mm -hmm. can't get very much through it. Uh, and it's and what's thought to happen is, and this is a really actually, Bill, this is a really one of the most exciting areas of research. I think that what now seems to be the case is that that barrier is is just is not as good in in age. Certainly, when you age, that barrier becomes less uh, strong. Uh -huh. And in many and in many diseases, so it definitely breaks down. So when we say it breaks down, these junctions open up, or, or even you can believe it or not, you can move you can move things across the cells themselves. Basically, you get small you get small uh, vesicles or little carry you know you, you get little uh, what you, cargos can get carried across the cell, mm -hmm. and that that increases. And in stroke, that definitely happens. In Alzheimer's disease, there's some evidence now that blood-brain barrier is is disrupted as well. So it's quite wow. an exciting area of research. Uh, wow. So it's there, you know, the blood-brain barrier is designed to protect the brain, but it definitely breaks down in disease and might and might therefore be a contributor towards certain conditions and certain behaviours. Right. Is there any way to... Are they measuring the blood-brain barrier? Do people physically able yeah, to so measure. We can do that now. And, and that's that's why we're beginning to understand mm. more about this. You know, one of the challenges in medicine and science is obviously trying to understand what's happening in, in a real in a living organism, particularly in, in humans. Uh, the brain is obviously not easy to study because it's 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 trapped in a in a in the skull. Mm. But imaging, you know, things like and many, many people listening will have had a, a, a scan, a brain scan, and you mentioned mm -hmm. brain scans. So if you have an MRI scan, for example, and we and these these techniques, increasingly scientists are improving and come up with new new techniques to, to be able to visualize or see what's happening in the brain. And one way to do that is to is to do you can image the blood brain barrier. So what you can do, and it's actually quite simple when you think about the concept, is to inject something into the blood. Mm -hmm. That can be that you can see using a mag uh, an MRI scanner. Mm -hmm. Basically, it will cause a change in what the picture looks like on an MR scanner. And if if it, if the blood brain barrier is leaky, that substance will leak into the brain. Wow! So you'll be able to see you'll be able to see a change in the brain in terms of leakage of substance, uh, and that that's what's that's what's now being done. Similar to being, an angiograph. Exactly. So if you think about an angiograph, you know, obviously if it if there's leakage of, of the contrast into the brain, then mm. that tells you your blood brain barrier is leaky. So that mm. people are now doing that a lot more uh, to to try and understand when 
when there's blood brain barrier damage leakage and where about as well importantly you know which part of the brain for example might be affected wow fascinating absolutely fascinating so i have a question that came up in my mind about yeah. anesthetic general anesthetic yeah. how does that put people to sleep does that impact the brain does it uh, go through the blood brain barrier I, I know that the, again it might not be an area, an area that you've studied or researched any idea like how simply how how anesthetic works does it go through a different mechanism to actually put people into a state of uh sleep so, I know, suppose. Uh, anesthetics you know whether it be local anesthetic or general anesthetics basically or or, or drug is a it's obviously a drug so it, it but it what it does is it it will uh, bind to so all, all trans the brain the whole body is controlled by neurotransmitters so the bit you know everything we do is controlled by these proteins these substances chemicals that, that move around the body and these chemicals must to have an action these chemicals uh, need to interact or, or or bind to a protein on the surface of a cell so they'll, they'll bind to a, a protein on the surface of a cell and then they'll cause some effect so for example when we can being able to speak and produce, you know, sounds or to be able to hear is all caused by transmitters and causing changes. So in anest anesthetics, basically, uh, block, <laughs> they block signaling. Uh -huh. They block signaling in, 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 in the important parts. It's a different so mechanism. it's a local anesthetic. We'll do a local anesthetic. We'll do that locally. Mm. So it'll stop the movement, for example, of, of, uh, of basically. Yeah. And what happens is when a, when a, a neurotransmitter binds to its its receptor or its protein on a cell surface. What typically happens is that the, it causes a, a change in the membrane of the cell and it allows ions to flow in and out. Mm -hmm. So and that will change the cell properly. The cell will then change and that will cause a change, something downstream to happen. Anesthetics stop that happening. They block it. They stop it happening, basically. Right. And that's so local anesthetic will do it in a local a localized yep. way and yep. a general anesthetic a general anesthetic will act in such a way to put you to sleep basically yeah and similar to an epidural you know, if you think of an epidural an epidural mm. is where people get obviously block uh, of low typically it's used obviously in, in pregnancy or for lower lower body surgery and that's because you can you can inject basically the, the, the anesthetic directly into somebody's spine mm. spinal cord and it acts to stop signals it, it binds to these receptors and stops signals traveling. It stops the pain, basically. Any pain wow. signals coming up to the brain. Right. Okay, so it's a completely different mechanism. It doesn't require access via the blood-brain barrier. It is a very different thing. And uh, okay, all right, that answers that. So your research into this, quote-unquote, new version or new different type of TPA uh, drug uh, is work being done in just Manchester University with that stuff or is there work being done in multiple places around the world and when you get to the end of your studies of your research of your current program which is about 18 months away you mentioned how long before then how, how quickly does that knowledge that understanding that new data enable the next phase to occur how long does it take to get to be used and adopted by hospitals and uh, uh doctors around the world uh, my honest answer is too long uh, so you know one of the challenges in research is is actually moving things more quickly you know along the pipeline as we call it the trans, you know we call it a translational pipeline so basically mm -hmm. from the first discovery to take it into you know early studies in, in patients and then trial. And and that, and it'll be no surprise for people to hear that, that depends on on several things, not least funding, because you've got to fund, you know, to do more research and to do more work needs money. That the bottom line is you need money to to pay the salaries of the scientists that do the work, et cetera, to buy the drug or to do whatever you need to do. Uh, and that process, that process to secure money takes time it takes a lot of time because there's, there's not enough money basically there's not enough money you're out, out there to fund all the research that people want to do so the process of getting money itself takes time so you have to obviously 
you have to write an application to to apply for money that can take sometimes a year it can take a year to apply wow. and get a decision on whether that project will be funded so that's a delay and then obviously then you've got to do the work and you've got to then convince people that it's you know it's real that you've actually got good evidence that this is a, a new drug for example and then you've got to take it along the pipeline of of testing it if you know, if, it's a, if it's a brand new drug it needs to go through very complex safety tests to show it's not going to cause harm uh, and you mentioned dexamethasone in terms of side effects you know, you've got to basically show your drug is is not going to cause harm that, that counteracts any benefit basically so it's it takes a long time and you say so many it can take many years decades if not to get a drug but i think my hope is the drug i talked about there the one that's a new clot buster could be could be quicker because it's a you know we think that it's another form of this drug has been tested in man before and humans before so that mm -hmm. that suggests it's safe to use mm -hmm. And uh, so we, it could be quicker, but it, it does you know, it does depend on further research. Of course, we need to prove, we need to do more experiments to prove it, it works and it's better than TPA. Uh, so in the best, you know, the, 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 it's hard to predict. It really is dependent on, on a bit of luck in terms of, you know, things happening, funding and having mm. the right people to do the research. And that's where... You know the fantastic support of the the Natalie Kate Moss Trust, who who kindly you know have gone on as a legacy to to Natalie. They've gone on to raise money to fund our hemorrhage research, and that's been a, a really fantastic uh, bonus to us. And it's been really driven our research much faster because they're raising they're raising money for us basically to do research directly. So it cuts out that it cuts out the the. The bit in the middle where you've got to write applications and wait for a year to get decisions and you're you're competing against all sorts of other applications to get funding. Yeah. It seems like a blinding flash of the obvious now when you say it, when uh, we can't penetrate the blood brain barrier, but then we've got somebody's head open. So while we've got it open, why don't we uh, access yeah. the area that we need to? Why don't we put this particular drug in there? Yeah. Um, and kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hopefully kill no one, but you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but um, does, is that a gutsy move? Is that something that takes a long time for somebody to say, hey, why don't we just put it in the hole you've already created and see what happens? How do they get to the point where they do that? Or has there been research on rodent, um, uh, rodent populations and then as a result, they get to this yeah, so there's been, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is there's been a lot of research in rodent models of stroke where, where drugs have been given directly to the brain because obviously uh -huh. you know it's 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 a uh, that you know you can do that uh, as i use more easily but you can do it more easily in, 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 a, in a road in a rat or a mouse than, than a human because of course you know it's not you've got to think about the cost benefit in a human that you're going to and we've talked about that aspect in your surgery yeah and and actually we know these they work and actually one of the one of the problems people think because a lot of drugs have been shown to work in terms of stroking in animals but they don't work in, in humans and it's the uh -huh. question is why the reality is and this is particularly the case maybe 20 years ago in the, in the 90s is that the drugs often were tested in animals by giving it directly into the brain and then they went and did a trial where the, the drug was given into the blood in the patient uh -huh. And, and and so of course there was no evidence to say that that drug in the blood then got into the brain. Uh -huh. So the concept that you, if you give it directly into the brain, is going to have benefit is is definitely, you know, people that's true. So the question just is, is in humans, how do you get that, and how do you get drugs into the brain? Uh, and one way is through surgery. That's okay. happening anyway, and that's so yeah. it's not it's not. And people have thought about this obviously before, not just me. Yeah. Uh, and also, there's a lot of effort being done by, you know, research groups around the world to try and find clever ways to get things into the to to try and move things better into the brain. Uh, and and we've got some research where we're doing that same thing. So you know, we've we've got some research where we we know that if you so lithosomes are basically small packets. Uh, they're basically carriers of, of drug and liposome and, and the, one of the COVID, one of the coronavirus. COVID-19 vaccines uses a liposome to deliver it. 
So it basically is a little package that you can put drugs inside it, it'll move around the body. And it's, these are used in cancer. And actually, we've got some evidence now that in stroke, the, the, these liposomes get into the brain better. Uh, they, they get, they seem to access the brain after somebody has a stroke uh, selectively. So that, that gives us the opportunity, we think, to give to either attach a drug to the surface of that, that so-called liposome or to uh, put it inside the liposome. So it's so like a little bag that carries the drug to the brain. So there's right. lots of work we've done uh, to try and do that. That's fascinating. So in the in the situation with the inflammatory response, right? So interleukin yeah. one, yeah, uh, is it? There seems to be a benefit of interleukin one because, well, is it beneficial? Blocking it, yeah, blocking it. Yeah. We think there, it, se yeah. there seems to be a benefit to having the response where interleukin one is released into the area that's been injured, right? Um, and is it possible that when delivering this new drug to uh, to decrease the amount of interleukin one that you're causing harm elsewhere, is it possible that it's doing too much of the reversal of interleukin one and therefore interfering with some other part of the healing response or the recovery response? Uh, so that's a really good question because obviously in, you know interleukin one is a is a key you know what we call is one of the main inflammatory cytokines. So it's mm. it's it's used to it's used to fight infection, for example. It mm. and it's so one of the, so one of the questions we always get asked is if you stop this, if you give the drug interleukin one receptor antagonist to stop IO one action, then do you cause more infections? Because you know as a, as a for an example, and it does you so. So there's many trials been done with I1 array in terms of it's using COVID, actually in COVID. It's been used in COVID and shown to be effective in COVID, actually. The trials been done show that there's a very slight, a very slight risk, increased risk of infection, but it's very low. Mm -hmm. And these are not common in infections. And we've done some research here in Manchester where we think that's because actually, although I one is important in infection, it the there are other paths, there are other mechanisms. The body has other ways to fight infection that are mm -hmm. not solely, that don't only need IL-1. So therefore mm -hmm. by blocking it to do, to prevent damage, you're not causing an increase in infection. Of course, you know, what we don't know is, and this is again, research we, we're, we need to do, is how long do you block it? You know, how long do you stop it working for? And that's a mm -hmm. question which is true of any any pathway because inflammation Certainly what we know is in, in, in the stroke to brain, if somebody has a stroke, there is definitely ongoing inflammation in, in the broadest sense. You know, there are there are what we would call inflammatory processes happening over many weeks and months, if not years, in somebody's brain. Mm -hmm. And of course, the key question is, are these are these inflammatory processes actually doing trying to do some good? Are they trying to, you know, help the brain to repair, to, mm -hmm. to allow new connections to form to make the brain barrier better uh, and we don't until you do the tests of course you don't know that uh, so that that's important so the, the time you treat for is important and that's where we need that's why we need that's why we need, we need more research to try and understand that uh, situation you know of course the advantage we think of the giving a, an inhibitor. So, so at the moment, all we propose is if you block, stop IO1 acting very early on in the first day, then that should be at least enough to cause a reduction in damage. So that right. question is, you we're only giving the drug yeah. for, a, for a short period of time. In the acute, very acute phase. In the acute phase. And that has advantages in that it, it prevents, it stops any potential mm. side effects. Mm. Mm. It's actually relatively cheap. So in terms of the health economics, because of course any treatment that's given to patients needs to be paid for. And, and one of the challenges in the health and in, 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 in health services across the world, health providers, is the cost of drugs can be very expensive. So actually if you're giving a drug only once or twice uh, and it's not an expensive drug, then of course that that's from a health economics point of view, that's that's good because it's it's doable.
Yeah. Uh, so, and, and if it, but yeah, we and are inter- we are interested in in ongoing inflammation in the brain. We're also very interested in whether some of the things that happen early after stroke. So one of the th- one of the things we definitely know happens is when you have a stroke in the brain, the immune cells in the blood change. You know, so they actually, you know, if you can imagine the, the 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 blood, the immune system can tell there's been a damage to the brain, and the the immune cells become different. They they change their properties. We don't really know why they change their properties, and what that means longer term. And we have funding now. We have a we have funding across several centres in Europe and North America to try and understand that more, particularly in relation to, uh, and you talk to yourself. Bill, about some of the problems you had thinking and just you know doing things that you normally you did before your stroke that just mm. weren't you weren't as good as doing it as you as you previously were, mm. and that's basically cog- that's what we call cognitive decline. You know, there's mm. there's a cognitive change that people's ability to process, to to do things, whether it be speaking, whether it be reacting to something, whether it be uh, remembering, becomes changed. About thirty percent of people who have a stroke will get cognitive decline. Some will get dementia, about 30% get dementia. And we don't understand, we don't know why, to be honest, we really don't know why. But we think, and we, we, you know, one hypothesis is that actually some of these changes that happen very early to immune cells have a longer term consequence uh, on the brain to cause, you know, changes in brain function. Yeah. And the, the exciting thing is, of course, if you prove that or you can demonstrate that that's true, then you can very early after the stroke, you can you can in- intervene and try and reverse these changes to then prevent the consequences of the stroke happening. I like that idea of early on getting getting having the intervention so that you can decrease the damage early on because it's early on when all the damage happens really it's yeah, at the yeah. first few hours of stroke and yeah. as it as it remains untreated it's getting worse and worse but that initial phase that sounds like that sounds extremely promising because then we are saving physically the brain in different Absolutely. parts and we're yeah restoring function sooner and that person's getting back to health quicker back to society quicker back to work quicker back to their family quicker everything is impacted in a positive way if we can intervene at the very early phase Absolutely. So, and we know love- that works you know we know i think and this is a beautiful thing you know although stroke is you know has you know it does have devastating consequences on on, on people but there are the good news is there's been real success in the last 20 years. You know, TPA does work. I think, you know, although we're trying to find a, you know, a better drug that, that might help more people, TPA does work. So TPA has really transformed mm. uh, outcomes in ischemic stroke. And and people will, will may be aware over the last three or four years, you know, one of the biggest improve one of the biggest interventions that works is pull, actually physically pulling clots out. So what what the stroke What's happening now in many stroke centers across the world is they actually clots that are quite big mm. and maybe don't get broken down by TPA, they, they can pull them out. They can actually mm. physically retrieve them. Uh, and that is where that works, it's highly successful. You know, highly successful. The outcomes are incredible. You know, somebody can go from being really completely that, you know, uh, uh, major defects to basically walking out the hospital. Yeah. Few years later. So it's- I'm certain I've interviewed stroke survivors who have had TPA and had interventions like that. And they they tell you they've had a stroke and it doesn't look, oh, you know, I'm going to use really terrible words because I don't like that. The thing I'm about to say, they don't look like they've had a stroke. They don't act like they've had a stroke. They don't, they don't tell you that they have deficits like someone who's had a stroke. Like there's nothing about them that suggests stroke yet they have actually had a stroke and some of the things that they're left with um, some, some of those people might be um, some fatigue or a little bit of, you know, memory issues or something minor that you would say, you know what, that is a great outcome for you for any person who has an outcome like that, because we know what stroke can do. Um, Everything goes right for that person. You know, they notice some symptoms, they get help, they get seen immediately, they get given the uh, correct uh, intervention immediately and you know, within a couple of hours, they are they they they, well, you know, back to 
a, a level of health that they were very close to before the stroke instead of having nine months of rehabilitation a lifetime of walking with uh left side or right side deficits and so on so i love the idea of that this is really exciting to interview somebody who's at in your role who does the kind of work that you do because that's the kind of hope that we stroke survivors are are, are waiting for we're waiting for something to turn up because we know how devastating it is we actually a lot of the people who come on this podcast do it to raise awareness um so that somehow what's happened to us something good comes out of it we can uh potentially help other people who have had a stroke uh recover quicker have less impact from it uh and so on so uh even though some of these drugs might not be beneficial to me i love the idea of the fact that they're going to be beneficial to other people because we know that uh, i think the world stroke organization now has revised the number of people that will have a stroke in their lifetime to one in four from one in six it's way too many people that are due to have a stroke in the future it's just something that i can't even i don't even want to think yeah. about um so knowing that that there's going to be more that we can do for those people and hopefully decrease the amount of negative impact uh that's really really amazing that's really exciting and promising well, you know I, you know i think you know, my own i think it's fantastic that people like yourself bill and other stroke survivors you know do so much to raise awareness because you know we you know many of the things we talk about and are being researched are, are and I, you know it sounds terrible to say are too late for people who have had a stroke because yeah. many of these things are about early treatment but and i think that's why we need research to do that we need we still need research that's going to bring better treatments for early but we also need to do more research on trying to improve the, those things that are affecting people's lives, quality of life. And you talk, and, and the, you mentioned yourself, and actually you mentioned, you know, what's becoming pretty evident now, actually, is more people survive. You know, survival rates now are, are, are much better for ischemic stroke. So although the, sort of, the major uh, uh, changes that people will typically relate to so movement problems or speech problems or you know they are being lessened because of the treatment actually things like fatigue and memory problems aren't so that's that in some ways as scientists we need to understand we need to try and understand why that is you know why yeah. is okay so you're getting blood back into the brain quicker which is basically what tpa does in, in thrombectomy so you're getting the blood back into the brain and that's obviously helping the major physical deficits but actually mm. some of these more subtle, but yet really, really, you know, have major impacts on somebody's quality of life are, yeah. are happening. So we'll, so the question for scientists is why that is. And fatigue is a fatigue is really, you know, one of these ones that stroke survivors often report as being the, one of the most debilitating yeah. things that happen. And we really have no understanding as to what fatigue is in terms of the brain function. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I'd be able to have a conversation with you about what fatigue is. And I love that the nuance in that question, what is fatigue? Be yeah, yeah, but there is seems to be a lot of uh, work also being done by researchers around the world about the fact that fatigue might be linked to a, a gut issue. So um, there's an article that I'm reading right now. It's available on neuroscience news and research i think uh now it, the 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 website is technologyworks.com anyway there's a group of american researchers who have who are looking at the possibility that stroke uh, impacts the gut in a negative way and restoring gut health could help save brain function or it could help minimize the amount of fatigue, for example, that somebody might experience. Now, in my own personal experience, one of the things that I needed to do as soon as I realized that doctors were trying to decrease inflammation in my brain and they were doing it with dexamethasone, which was horrible, um, I was on dexamethasone for about three weeks and then had to be weaned off it. Um, 
when I realized how horrible it was and that I put eight kilos on in about two and a half weeks, uh, that I wasn't sleeping, that I was having hallucinations, uh, that I, my skin was crawling. Uh, I was eating about 4,000 calories a day, double what I would normally eat because it just made me ridiculously hungry. It dro I think it was drop my, my blood sugar, did all these things. And when I realized that I wanted to not be on dexamethasone anymore, although I didn't stop taking it, I did whatever doctors told me to do. Um, I thought I'd look into ways that I, I think I did a Google search that was something like how to decrease uh, inflammation in the brain. And one of the first things that came up was an anti-inflammatory diet. And what I thought was that the anti-inflammatory diet was impacting my head. But what I know now from, you know, what we spoke about with regards to the blood brain barrier, the anti-inflammatory diet wasn't specifically doing anything to the head. What it was doing was decreasing inflammation in the gut. And as a result of that, I was having positive experiences on the neurological front. And of course, I'm early on in this whole process. I don't know what it means. I just know that when I'm not eating sugar and when I'm not eating certain carbohydrates like like glutinous bread, um, like uh, white rice, uh, like we, we call them soft drinks, you guys might call them sodas. When I wasn't consuming food like that, I was having less uh, fatigue episodes. And the more and more I got that out of my diet and the less I was spiking my insulin, the less I was having fatigue episodes or they were more, or they were, le they were less dramatic in the way that they impacted me in a negative way. So there is some weird, well, it's not weird. I mean, everything in our body is connected, right? In yeah. some way, shape or form. So there's some amazing connection between how how we can treat the gut, how how we look after our gut, and how that impacts uh, how that impacts our experience after a stroke, our neurological experience, and that is one of the only things that I found comfort from initially was because how do I take control of my situation a little bit? How do I control one part of this? crazy thing that's happened to me the only thing i can do is control what i what i consume and of course the more i look into it you know there's books by da dr david perlmutter there's books there, who's a, a neurologist there's um uh uh a whole bunch of other amazing people who don't who uh, uh there's there's grain brain by uh, another guy like there's there's there's, there's all these books who that talk about how we can positively impact the the brain but it doesn't it's still even though i know that it still doesn't make sense to me after what we've just discussed after the fact that we cannot uh nothing penetrates the blood brain barrier yeah so i think so i think that sorry and i'm glad you've mentioned this bill because i'm i don't want the listeners to get the wrong idea so the blood brain barrier is a barrier, but it's not a complete barrier. So things do get in. So things uh -huh. that the brain needs get in. So for example, that's a relief. You have to get glucose. <laughs> you've got to get glucose into the brain because you've right. got to have glucose to give energy, and you've got to have oxygen to get into the brain, obviously through the red blood cell. And you need other nutrients. So you need other basically you need other nutrients to make to get into the brain to help the brain cells to work. So, uh, so sorry, yeah, I, I, I shouldn't have made it. I made it sound like it was a complete barrier. There okay. are special mechanisms by which things get into the brain. So, for example, any substance that can that is that is lipid soluble, so anything that can be go into lipids into fat will get across the brain into the brain very easily. And of course, it's no surprise, therefore, that certain dietary products, certain dietary things, are absolutely essential to get into the brain to sit to make the neurotransmitters I talked about. So, actually. The blood brain barrier keeps out toxins and bad things, but it, it definitely lets in good things. Right. Uh, and and I think the point you absolutely have nailed it on the head. You know, the gut brain axis is fascinating because definitely yes. the gut reacts to damage in the brain. And the, the gut barrier will break down. You know, the, the obviously the, the, the all all basically any any lining of the body that's exposed to the outside world is a barrier because of course yeah. you need to keep things out. 
And what we know is the gut has a, is obviously a very important barrier. If that barrier breaks down, then it, it will change what gets into the body. So bugs will get in, for example, you'll get microbes come in, mm -hmm. but also the ability to extract nutrients from food becomes changed. Uh, so, so it's the blood brain barrier is, is definitely, you know, is a, it's basically a key gateway. So it is a gateway. It's not a complete blocked off mm -hmm. seal. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think the argument you make is right. And there's good evidence actually. If people, if you eat a diet that's high, for example, in certain fatty acids, so they will get into the brain. They will, they will get into the brain and they then help the brain probably to repair, you know, cause you need, for example, if you, you know, the brain, most brain cells have, have myelin, they have, a, yes. you know, wrapped around the brain axons to make them work better. Yeah. So if you need to repair myelin, you need to get things into the brain to help to do that and make the cells work. So, so the, the key thing I think in, in thinking about most simply is the, the blood brain barrier, we need to promote the entry of things that are going to benefit mm -hmm. brain function and keep out bad things. Yeah, lovely. I love it. As we that makes sense. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, it's not a complete yeah. barrier. <laughs> it makes sense. It's uh it's a great conversation. Uh it's one that fascinates me, and that's why I love having people like you on the program, a neuroscientist who knows this stuff inside and out. Uh, it's just, I could, uh, it's just one of my favorite topics. It's just become one of my favorite topics and you can understand why. Um, but as we come to the end of the episodes, I know you're a busy person. You've got a lot, a, a lot of things to do. Um, and I want, I want you to get back to your research. Um, I, I'm wondering if you can talk at all about the, uh, work that you might be doing or that you're that you are going to be doing with the Melbourne University so I'm very pleased to hear that you guys have some kind of a relationship um, all the way from Manchester University um, to Melbourne University tell, can you tell me a little bit about that work yeah absolutely and it's you know it's quite exciting work so it, it relates to in inflammation again you know we've got a long interest in inflammation and I, I mentioned before that one of the challenges in brain research is trying to is getting a window into the brain. So actually, how can we, how can we tell what's going on over time in the brain? You know, in terms of different processes that might be good or bad after stroke. So what's and you've obviously, but what's fascinating is if you look at the eye, okay. If you look in the eye, the eye is basically part of the central nervous system in yes. terms of development. It, it's part of the central nervous system, the retina, in the cornea. So with researchers in Melbourne, so so some researchers in Melbourne, uh, uh, Holly Chinnery and, and Laura Downey, they work on the eye. They they are they are researchers who who study the eye, in terms of eye disease, but actually what they've also noticed is that if you you can use the the eye and it's it's a bit of a, a corny cliche is a window to the brain, and they've got some evidence now that actually things that are happening in the eye whether that be in, in the retina or whether it be in the cornea, actually might might reflect what's happening in the brain. So you can use it, as, a, as if you like, as a measure of brain inflammation. Uh, and particularly, they see some certain types of immune cell change in the eye that might... And they've shown that this is relevant to some Parkinson's disease. They've, they've shown in people who get cognitive... Uh, show some cognitive impairment there's changes in the in the eye. So we basically are going to combine with the team in Melbourne to study and compare changes that are happening in, in the eye to changes that are happening in the whole body to changes that are happening in the brain in terms of inflammation and try and understand more about these responses across the whole the whole organism over time. And it comes back to that time thing, that sort of temporal you know, window of a... Uh, you know, stroke is an immediate event, and then there's consequences that will go on for years, actually. And so that's so it's exciting. You know, it's very exciting research for us to use the expertise in Melbourne uh, to link it with our expertise in stroke. I mean, it's uh, totally amazing. I'm blown away. I could go on and on, but I won't. Um, yeah. um, thank you so much for uh, doing the work that you do. Firstly, um, you guys are the unsung unknown heroes in the background, your whole team, everybody who's involved and all the other people who are involved in helping um, 
people who you don't know who haven't yet had a stroke in case they have a stroke. I think that's just fascinating thing to be doing in your uh, in your life's work. Like, I, I think that's just amazing. I just love that there are human beings doing that for other human beings they've never met before uh, in case they get sick. I love it. <laughs> um, so thanks for that. Um, thanks for being on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, just uh, giving us an insight into that. I think it's going to be a really uh, fascinating topic and um, something that the stroke survivors and their caregivers who are listening will take some comfort from. Well, thanks, thanks, Bill, for you know for giving me the chance to speak about research, which you know I care so passionately about, and making a difference. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. I hope you learned something valuable and important. I certainly did. I absolutely love talking to the people who are behind the scenes, doing work for people they've never met and that they don't know, in the hopes of giving them a better result in case they have a hemorrhagic or an ischemic stroke. I mean, it's just fascinating and amazing that people choose to do that uh, and I'm grateful for them and uh, I probably have and many of you listening have already benefited from people that have devoted their lives to making our 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 recovery and the the seriousness of the condition that we had to uh, deal with uh, less impactful it's just unbelievable so I hope you got a lot out of it and uh, you can tell how much I got out of it. To learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and other pages and to follow a f and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. Sharing the show with family and friends on social media will make it possible for people who may need this type of content to find it easier. And that may make a massive difference to someone that is on the road to recovery after their own experience with stroke. If you're a stroke survivor, the story to share about your experience, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do is be a stroke survivor or care for someone who is a stroke survivor or be one of the fabulous people who help other stroke survivors. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com forward slash contact, fill out the form. And as soon as I receive it, I will respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for me and you to meet over Zoom. Thanks again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.